Hey guys, what's up? Another Wednesday evening here, and this is Optimus Tom in the Zone, my little Learn to League of Legends show to make you guys a better summoner. So, um, anyway, we had uh, a lot of stuff going on. We had uh, MLG Rally two weekends ago, and then we had at PAX Prime, we had the North American Regional Qualifiers, which were very, very awesome. I got to awesome, awesome chance to get to go to both of those back to back. A little unexpected, but regardless, it was absolutely Awesome! So, um, hopefully you guys were able to tune in and check those out. If not, well, that's why we have awesome VODs for you guys. I know MLG Rally has the VODs up at the MLG or MajorLeagueGaming.com website or MajorLeagueGaming.tv. I think it's just a quick little hot link in order to get over to those VODs. And in addition to this, uh, Riot Games, for some reason, decided to use Ustream as their uh, choice service. So if you actually just very quickly like Google like Riot Games Ustream, pops up with Ustream.com slash Riot Games, and you can actually just click on the archive thing, and there's a list of all the VODs and glorious HD vision, visionariness, and you can just, like, click on the things, and a lot of the things are trying, they're not exactly divided up, but you have, like, a four-hour VOD of, like, the entire thing of, like, oh, Dignitas versus TSM, or CLG versus Curse, or you have, like, the whole entire series commercials and everything there's no markers or anything you guys have to find it yourselves but regardless there's free hd vods which is never a bad thing to do whatsoever and it's also why we could do this amazing episode of in the zone because i'm going to be utilizing these free hd vods so uh if you guys haven't uh checked out the vods for some reason yet and you don't want to be spoiled by anything well too late you've read the title so uh, you might be a little bit spoiled with this but there are going to be a, a lot of spoiler alerts because we're going in depth with strategies that we saw at the pax prime north american regional qualifiers last week on in the zone before two weeks ago technically because i wasn't able to do one after rally we went over what cheese was and what kind of strategies would have expected to see at rally or pax prime and what we were going to possibly get out of these teams and one of the things that we mentioned was early aggression and although it didn't come out into full fruition the way I m might have hoped it would have by seeing aggressive junglers and by seeing level 2 ganks and by seeing constant applied pressure it did actually come out in a different form which is something that CLG had actually used in Korea, I believe they used it against CLG EU when they had to face them in the group stages of the OG and Summer Championships tournament. I believe they busted it out against Invictus Gaming when they did a show match for them with uh, with OGN. Regardless, there was some sort of regression being shown by these teams, and it was done a little bit of a different way. There are two really big, big strategies that people were talking about the entire weekend. One is a strategy employed by CLG we're going to cover in this week's episode of In The Zone, and the next was a strategy um, used by Dignitas, which is the poke composition, something CLG and I had actually used like seven months ago to much effect and people thought originally was boring, but Dignitas brought it back up for this, um, this tournament, used it maybe not as effectively as CLG, but we'll be able to go over that one in depth hopefully next week on In The Zone. I think I want to keep this up so we could go super, super in depth in these strategies. Not only am I going to be able to identify what the teams did, um, what the what the champion choices were and why they did them, how they played the game out, every single inch of the jungle, their laning phase, and then their team fight phase, and how that really all came into fruition. But on top of this, I'm going to teach you guys how... Legion in their series against CLGNA was able to come back and defeat it and what measures they took to make sure they were able to beat this strategy and take it to a deciding game three. Also, um, I've been playing around with it in solo queue since I came home. Um, partnered up with my friend Chaz Wang, uh, Druidic Dwarf, if you guys remember him from battle arenas and such. Uh, he was playing a support character, I was playing the AD carry, and we got a VOD of how effectively you could use this in like solo queue or a normal games uh strategy and how it actually would pan out to you guys sitting here and being like well i don't care if you cover the pro games how's it going to help me well it is going to be able to help you and we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more in depth when the time comes but regardless of this clg busted out this interesting composition during the uh, north american regional qualifiers which included teleports and included promote it was a little weird as we can see here on screen, um, didn't really get a picks and bans thing for some reason. I wasn't able to find it. Maybe they just went, wasn't there in the recording. But we could see CLG is going to be the blue team. Legion is going to be the red team. So if we look at the side of Legion, it's a pretty standard team composition. You have Maokai for a pretty aggressive early gank, especially if you're able to get that blue buff into red buff, not using the smite on blue buff. Taking the smite on red buff and being able to get an extremely early twisted advanced level 3 gank, something that Lotta Mortis and the Odd One absolutely love to do. We see Zyra coming out in the mid lane. 
Uh, probably actually picking up Zyra despite not having played for a little while because of Wild Turtle. Uh, being used as a sub while probably was on vacation. Zyra comes out. Zyra gets nerfed. Probably says, hey, this is a pretty good champion. Picks up and plays it anyway to a lot of effect. They also have the Corky and Soraka composition. So there's a lot of poke going on on that bottom lane. And then they have Cruiser the Bruiser picking up Vladimir for the Hemo play. A lot of AoE damage. A lot of sustain on the team with the Vengeful Maelstrom in addition to Soraka's Wish. A lot of standard stuff that we've come to expect out of team compositions. But on the side of CLG over here, we have a Sivir and Sona. Tons of pushing power in that composition, not to mention sustain from Sona's heal. But they also both have, they have a teleport on that side. In addition to this, Sona is running promote. We have a Gragas in that mid lane who's also running teleport so he could be extremely mobile on top of the mobility that Gragas already brings to the table on a team composition, plus the immense amounts of poke and wave clearing that he has. Voiboy is playing Olaf, who if, if they decide to switch up the lanes, like a lot of teams in Korea have been doing, Olaf can sustain himself fairly well against Tower by maxing Undertow rather than going for a reckless swings kind of approach to a 1v1 lane. Hotshot GG is going to make out the round out the team composition with Dr. Mundo in the jungle, which is an interesting kind of pickup because a lot of this team are like, alright, it's about pushing, it's about poking, it's about prodding, it's about promoting. You put Dr. Mundo into the mix at one of the fastest clear times in the jungle, a champion known very, very well for counter-jungling and being a basically immobile, immovable, ill-killable tank in the later stage of the game. Ill-killable, yes, ill-killable, it's a new word. But um, you put them together in this giant team composition, you basically have a team that is very adept at pushing, very adept at teleporting towards objectives that they need to secure, um, teleporting into team engagements just to turn it around on top of Legion's head, and then once that advantage has been generated after that team fight, continuing to push down that lane, gaining themselves map presence, gaining themselves global objectives, taking down towers, and giving themselves an overall advantage as quickly as possible. You have Dr. Mundo invading the enemy jungle, especially if you get an Oracle's Elixir early on him, denying vision to the enemy team, which is going to be key to your strategy, because you're going to be pushing around, you're going to be pushed all the way up to your towers, you don't want a lot of mortars from the jungle, or perhaps even a wandering Prowly on Zyra, to come into your lane and really disrupt what you're trying to do with your promoted mid and with your pushing strategy. So picking a very aggressive counter jungler and someone with extremely quick clear time is very key to this. On top of it, Dr. Mundo is not a blue buff reliant champion. So as we'll see when the game starts, blue buff becomes something very important for the rest of the members on CLG in order to properly execute the strategy. So I'm going to flop, flip, flop over here back to the screen. And um, I mean, I've basically talked everything about we possibly could about the champion picks and their overall team composition. So uh, unfortunately, one of the things that you stream is I can't pinpoint accuracy onto exactly where I want to go. This is actually exactly where I want to go. So um, one of the things that we do see CLG doing very effectively is, well, unfortunately, it was uh, not, not as pinpoint as I had hoped it to be. But uh, one of the things we do see CLG going to do is they're going to be donating the blue buff to Voiboy. Voiboy is going to stay in that top lane, and they're anticipating some sort of lane swap, or they want Voiboy to have some sort of advantage to push his lane back onto the members of Legion. So we could see now Ping's going down, Mundo is starting over here at his own rates, we could see Legion is going to pan over here to try to check out what's going on at blue buff, but for some reason they don't pursue. This is one of the first mistakes that Legion makes with this. They go over here, try to identify what's going on, realize that nobody's like protecting or anything, poke down here, and they see everybody hiding in the brush. Like, okay, no one's doing anything by blue buff. Very good point for CLG here. They get very, very secretive. And they donate the blue buff over to Voiboy, who is going to be going into a 1v2 top lane. This is not only going to let Voiboy spam those axes a lot better, it's going to give him pushing power back onto the 1v2. And by that, it's going to give him survivability. If you're going to be having a blue buff on your solo top, who's going to be throwing axes back and forth, well, he's going to be able to sustain himself fairly well and in addition to this he's not going to be able to be have that He's going to have that cushion where he's going to have a little bit of space to still fall back to his tower, but he's not going to be pushed back so far that Lauda Mortis can easily come from behind and gank as a 3v1 in that top lane. In addition to this, he's going to keep his farm up, he's going to be able to harass upon the champions, and that's going to keep Soraka from being super, super aggressive with those star calls. We've seen a lot of people getting earlier and earlier into the game, especially in this 1v2 meta, and force her to go for those heals and force her to keep up on Corky's HP. 
So very awesome stuff already coming out from CLG just to make sure they execute the strategy properly. In addition to this, we see since Olaf is going into a 1v2 lane on the top lane, they have a lane swap in the other two lanes to generate the advantage and generate the push where they need it to be. Middle lane is one of the most important lanes in the game. We've heard Freak and Riveting talking about this throughout the entire course of the tournament. It is one of the shortest ways to get into your enemy base. In addition to this, just look at the minimap right now. The middle lane is quite literally in the middle of everything. If you're trying to generate some sort of advantage by counter jungling, by going into other lanes and pushing down towers and garnering global objectives like Dragon or Baron or these buffs on either side of the river, it's going to be key that you control the flow of the game, and everything has to eventually flow through the middle lane. So by sending your AD and your support into a 2v1 in the mid lane, you're already generating some sort of an advantage over a very squishy mage character, who even though in the early and mid stages of the game puts out a lot of high DPS, you can keep down their mage character, you can make sure that they are not generating the advantages they need to help their team out in those mid-game uh, points where they're going to be trying to stand off against your aggression. In addition to this, the promote on Chowster is going to do so much work against Prolly. He is not expecting to go into this lane in this 1v2. He doesn't really know how to deal with it because he doesn't know the kinds of aggression he's going to see. Of course, Sona and Sivir are going to be poking like crazy. That's what they do in a 2v2 lane to begin with. So now you're going to have all this extra aggression down on your mid-AP caster who can't take the beating as much as an AD character who's going to be able to trade effectively in these situations or have their own support character to try to make up for the extra damage they're taking or mitigate some of the aggression from the enemy team. Now you're going to be throwing a promoted minion into the mix. This is going to push the lane and not only this, a promoted minion I believe deals 43 damage at the early stages of the game. That is basically auto attacks from a support character. In addition to this, they're going to be super, super beefy, have more HP than any champion in the game at this point, even Dr. Mundo, and it's going to be extremely difficult for a very squishy mage character to try to deal with this. They're going to have to use spells, they're going to have to let the tower tank shots, they're going to have to use up all their resources just to combat this promoted minion. Not to mention the fact that they're still in a 2v1 lane. So this is some sort of advantage you need to try to generate from this team composition. You really want to be able to... I'm just going to let the, the VOD run for a little bit because the next point's in like 30 seconds. We can see the poke already being put down by Sona, the poke and the harassment being put down by Sivir, just farming up, and just the, th the threat of harassment is enough at this point in time. But you're going to wind up generating advantage. Not only this, but you can have Sona ward up areas of the enemy jungle. You can have her go in and harass down an early game jungler, like uh, early level jungler, a lot of Mortis. And having the roaming capabilities from this mid lane is also very key. That's why we see characters like Twisted Fate and Rise and Morgana constantly roaming around from their mid lane to generate advantage. Gragas is another one. On top of this, you have the 1v1 on bottom lane. You have an AP going up against, well, Vladimir is an AP. It's a fairly even matchup. You would see this matchup in mid lane even sometimes. And here we go already. Nope. I'm going to go back a little bit. Nope. Not, not that back. We need... Okay. Apparently, it's not going to let me do it. So, I'm going to let the VOD run again. But, um, as I was going to say... You have the first promoted minion hitting down at about the three minute mark. And you can see right now, Prowly is still level one. Everybody is still level one. The third wave, every single time minion spawn is going to have that siege minion. The siege minion gets promoted into a big, ridiculously strong minion and is going to be wailing away on things. We can even see Prowly already being pushed back to his tower, having the last hit against it. Four CS compared to the eight of Sivir. She's doubling him at this point in time. Here we go, promoted minion, bam. Now not only is the wave pushed to the tower with remnants of the last wave already, but there's a promoted minion in the mix. There are two champions. Both of them are the same level as the solo champions. It's not like they're missing out on experience or anything. And Prolly has already used a chunk of his mana, already had to use some of his health potions because of the harassment and the damage coming down from the minions. And now you have this giant promoted minion that is going to be wailing down on the tower. They want to take down this tower quickly. They want to roam around to other lanes and they want to be able to abuse their teleport if for some reason Legion creates a dynamic advantage in a different lane. So if you're going to continue to advance this VOD, what we're going to find out is by about the five and a half minute mark, CLG has been able to not only garner a lot of kills we could see from the game, but have been able to knock down this middle tower to half of its HP. 
Also, by looking at the bottom of your screen, you can see that Sivir has three times the amount of CS as Zyra in the mid lane. Zyra has had to go for a Chalice of Harmony. Now, the commentators were saying, oh, Zyra should have built some sort of armor. Okay. Well, first off, what the hell is armor going to do on a mid AP caster? Second off, it's not going to do anything against the fact that she's just being harassed down. Giant ganks from Dr. Mundo with those, with those cleavers, those infected cleavers, are going to just chunk away HP regardless. That is also magic damage. You're going to have magic damage coming out from the poke from Sona. Yes, Sivir is going to be dealing a decent amount of AD damage on top of Sona's auto attacks and power cords stacking up on the damages, but probably is really getting this Chalice of Harmony not for the resistances, not for it's a way to stay alive in lane by sustaining himself through his mana. We've already mentioned a little bit earlier that he's going to have to burn through spells to get these minions off the tower to deal with the promoted minions still have some mana left in his reservoir to try to root down an enemy advancing champion so he can just get away and live so very early early aggression generating an advantage at some point in time in one of these lanes is extremely extremely crucial not to mention this but mundo has been running around effectively denying lot mortis his ganks having mundo clear out the jungle at an extremely quick pace and then immediately rush into the enemy jungle has proven extremely effective for clg they even caught lot mortis trying to run around a very very long path in mid lane to try to gank the 2v1 middle at level 3 Three. Hotshot was already in the same place though, found Lot of Mortis, and they wound up picking up a kill, donating it to Sona because of the nice flash over the wall. But regardless, they're still able to pick up a very early kill, continue to generate these advantages by staying aware on the map and staying active with their pushes in their adv advantageous lanes and just basically generating all their advantages as much as possible. We can see that as we keep this up, the tower is only going to get lower and lower. Eventually, 7 minutes and 30 seconds into the actual game, the mid tower actually goes down after an engagement between Sivir and Zyra, where Zyra just absolutely melted under the ridiculous amounts of damage that Double Look was able to put out on Sivir. So now that they have the middle lane down, this is what's going to make CLG even scarier. Mundo d disappears back into his jungle. Double Lift goes back, has 49 CS, 2 kills, 3 assists, and a tower kill on his team. He already had Berserker's Grease and Double Dorans. He's going to be able to go back, buy some items. S uh, Sona, with a Heart of Gold in addition, now a Fairy Charm going for that Philosopher's Stone, is going to be at a ridiculous advantage in this game. Legion has to group up as four members in order to take their own objectives like this blue buff. CLG is just immediately taking the fight to Legion and trying to put this stranglehold on them so they can just do whatever they want in the later stages of the game. Split push, promote push, teleport into team fights, and just be that much stronger than Legion. So Legion has absolutely nothing that they can do to try to come back into this one. Advancing even further, they're going to try to generate these advantages even more and more now the fact that middle lane is down. With the middle lane down, they're going to be able to do things like roam around. Sivir's already level 7. Dub uh, Chowster on Sona is actually only level 5, but look, Vladimir is level 6. They're going to be able to come down here, and now that Vladimir has saw Greg, it's like, oh, okay, nothing's wrong. Oh, wait, the middle lane is missing. The middle lane's been dead, and boom, it's a 3v1 situation against poor crews of the Bruiser in the bottom lane. And he's just absolutely dead. So CLG is going to be like, all right, well, uh, we generated an advantage. We uh, continue to do this. And uh, we're just going to push down on this tower. And as we'll see here, with a wave of minions, with the clearing power of Gragas, Sever, and Sona, with the aura to give them extra damage and everything, this tower is going to go down 18 seconds after the gank. Just a couple more whales, promoted minion just in case. So the wave continues to push when they're gone. And boom, they knock down the tower. And that is two towers down at about 9 minutes and 18 seconds into the game. So that's absolutely insane. So CLG is going to continue this pressure by roaming around. Voidboy in this top lane is doing a great job against Corky. 59 CS to 70 CS. That is almost on par as an AD carry. The only thing that Legion can do in this lane is continue to push down upon Olaf. And Olaf, with that early blue buff, was able to sustain himself and be good at this. Going back, picking up a Philosopher's Stone, he has the regen on his mana and the regen on his HP to be able to survive these trades. Activate a W with those minions under the tower, and it's going to negate most of the damage that Corky's trying to harass upon you. If Corky decides to go for a trade, Olaf can chain 
some axes together and get a reckless swing down and Corky all of a sudden is missing a large majority of his health. They're continuing to give Boy Boy these blue buffs as well so he's able just to keep up in lane. Corky decided he was going to go back and buy a phage to try to, you know, generate some sort of mid-game advantage with that Trinity Force, maybe force some sort of trades with Olaf. But look, Olaf is almost on par with CS still, 79 to 69. Olaf is doing a wonderful job in this 1v2 top lane that they have going on. CLG is also continuing just to roam around the map entirely. We see Mundo constantly on Legion's side of the river. We see Sivir and Sona now continuing to roam around. Gragas is one of the only people besides Olaf who stayed in the lane. So that middle lane, like I said, the one that's going to be a huge focus of this game, that's going to control where everybody's able to go, that middle lane not only are, is the lane and the vision and the area and the map presence that it provides super effective for, the, for your team composition, but the people who are in that lane become forces to be reckoned with as well as the game slowly progresses. Now we can see Chowster is going to get the Oracle's Elixir to keep Legion in the dark. Lot of Mortis is responding with his own Oracle's Elixir to try to keep his team ahead with some sort of advantage. CLG, a little bit of a dirt moment here. Don't realize that there's a ward right here. They actually had to put some pings down and then like, oh wait, there's a ward right there. Oh, okay. So by continuing to keep up all these, uh, this roaming, to keep continuing to keep up this denial of vision, they're going to keep their lead above Legion. As we can see right now, 18K to 13.3K. It's about a 5K gold advantage at 11 minutes and 40 seconds into the game. They're going to continue this aggression by keeping Legion clumped up. Legion has to move as a unit of four or five in order to do anything. The unit of four from CLG is stronger than the unit of five from Legion at this point because of the massive gold differential. This is going to allow Olaf, who's in that top lane, who hasn't moved an inch the entire game, to just keep pushing, keep pushing, split push. They're going to catch the Munlaw as he tries to come back up into this lane. Probably is going to have to be up here to try to defend as well. But eventually, with all this aggression coming out from CLG, we see Olaf with the Ragnarok, so he's get knocked up from the Zyra ultimate. Hotshot's going to continue poking and prodding away at those infective cleavers. Mid lane's going to generate advantages wherever they can by pushing promoted minions and taking out the jungler who's trying to come up and help. This is going to let CLG not only take this middle tower, but they're also going to be able to take the top tower at almost the same exact time. And now at about 12 and a half to 13 minutes into the game, CLG is going to be at a 4 to 0 tower advantage over Legion. And Legion, already on the back pedal, now 6,000 gold behind, soon to be 7,000 gold behind as that tower goes down, have to try to find something to do. They have lost every single lane at this point. The only way they can farm is by trying to bring it back towards their tier 2 towers and freezing a lane or something, but CLG is keeping up with the constant aggression, moving back into these lanes when they see that they're trying to be frozen, and trying to push them out a little bit, generate some sort of advantage, do something to keep Legion from getting back into this game. Mundo, Sivir, and Sona are doing a great job of this as well by continuing to take down the enemy buffs. If you look at the minimap right now, red buff for Legion is gone. Blue buff for Legion has respawned, but no one's being able to move and contest it yet because of the map presence that CLG has established. Nobody at this point has really been able to generate a lot of wards in the river, but it doesn't matter because we are able to pause the game right now. On this minimap, we see one, two, three, four, four, if not more, forward wards by CLG. They're not going to really care about the fact that they're on their side of the map, they already have established control of this. They're containing Legion into the pen of their own base and forward warding so as soon as Legion moves out just a little bit, they snap on the trap and close down and keep Legion pressed back on their own side of the river. Trying to force them to farm up against these secondary towers, taking all these advantages, playing a little bit of a mind game because if Legion is contained to their base with absolutely no vision on where CLG is, they're going to assume they're going for Dragon, they're going for buffs, they're going for Baron perhaps, which is what CLG wants them to do because then Legion's only response to stop that is going to be we could either sit back here and farm and hope that we get a very, very good team initiation and team fight going on or we can go and try to contest that. The minute Legion tries to go and contest some sort of objective from CLG, they spot it on the minimap. They realize someone's moving in the uh, moving in the woods by the red buff. Someone's coming in to try to take their blue buff and head towards Dragon. Someone is trying to ward around the Baron pit, and immediately they react. They have three teleports, so all those wards all of a sudden become choke points for ganks. Any single time 
um, Siver, uh, I'm sorry, Siver Soraka Sona, mixing all the names up. Any single time that Soraka tries to go out to ward, they could spring a trap on one of their own wards and just kill her outright, mop up the ward, and continue the advantage through map presence, through vision, and through just utter domination of their champions against Legion. Any single time Legion tries to move out as a team unit and they realize that one or two people are not all together and they go to contest a dragon or they go to move towards a baron or a crucial buff point that they need for their team to come back all of a sudden those wards become ways for the rest of clg to filter into a fight and even though they're ahead and earlier on in this game they were winning 4v5 engagements they could turn like a 3v2 into a 5v3 and all of a sudden legion is just lights out for them so they're having to play extremely passive and choose their battles extremely wisely but while this is going on clg is keeping up the aggression with pushes keeping up the aggression with overall global objective steals and just infinitely increasing their lead in gold at this point in time it's still 7,000 gold and we're not even 15 minutes into the game that's just how aggressive CLG strategy has been coming out of the gate this is just how aggressive they're playing and what they want to do so as we mentioned earlier about 13 minutes into the game CLG has a 7k gold advantage they continue to nab global objectives I believe in a couple seconds there's a, a bit more of example of this um well there's a replay going on for what they did with Lana Mortis but um I'm just going to keep talking about what I was talking about. Um, Nabbing global objectives prevent Legion from coming back in. CLG continuing to split push. But they're not going for the throat at all. At this point in time with a 7,000 gold advantage, you would think that CLG could just march up the mid lane and take Legion down. Legion, though, has a pretty good AoE composition. If they land a Ventral Maelstrom from Maokai, they're reducing the damage that they take from the members of CLG. On top of this, they're going to be able to turn a lot of damage back onto them. If they create a Ventral Maelstrom down, drop a Hemo Plague, and then Zyra's uh, Overgrowth, or I can't even remember the name of it right now, but Zyra's Ultimate gets knocked down on top of all that. There's a point in time we'll see where Prolly's Burst Damage shines through, even though he's been kept down a lot this game. But if they combine those three AoEs, CLG knows that that could be devastating for them. That would be the window of opportunity that Legion needs to come back into this one. So CLG, being CLG, is extremely content to just to sit back and split push away at Legion, much as CLG loves to do and has loved to do for basically forever. I do advance a little bit later into the game. I'm going to say late game, even though it's uh, you know like 20 minutes into the game. It's CLG has forced an early late game, which is something CLG loves. Even when Legion decides to go and engage, look at the amount of disengage. Look at the amount of control they have over everything. Shirelia's Reveries, Sona's move speed bonuses, Gragas Barrel, Infective Cleavers, Power Cords to slow people down. Undertoes to slow people down. CLG has the whim and will to engage and disengage any fight at all. They have the long range poke to force Legion into bad, uh, bad areas and bad situations. They have all the crowd control to try to turn fights. If they get overzealous like they do here, they are able to die. However, look at all the damage they've traded down onto Legion for that one kill. They are going to force Legion back, and even though they're at a 4v5, as I've been saying this entire game, CLG is so far ahead at this point, their four members are stronger than Legion's five, and they're going to continue to push down towers, continue to generate advantages, and continue to keep their opponents on the back foot. They're even going to continue to nine buffs 20 minutes into the game when they have almost a 10k gold advantage just so legion has absolutely no way out of just the i'm gonna say it again the stranglehold that clg is slowly but surely closing around their throats so that's how clg's push composition with the promotes with the teleports and everything has really been able to shut people down we've identified some of the most effective things First off, you need to have a promote and you need to have multiple teleports to always threaten the fact that you can come in and strike at any given moment. On top of this, you need an effective lane swap. If you swap lanes and get a 2v1 with a promote, especially in a squishy lane like middle, or if they have a top lane that has an early weak game like a Vladimir, you're able to take advantage of this, push down, and really push your point home as quickly as possible. Five and a half minute tower is down to half HP. Seven and a half minutes, the tower was down. Nine minutes and 18 seconds. Now that the roaming has the roaming has been opened up for CLG, they're able to get a gank down on that 1v1 lane turn it into a 3v1, knock down that tower at that 9 minute and 18 second mark. 13 minutes into the game, split pushing, forcing the team to try to combat your global objectives, letting Olaf in that top lane split push away. 
going up to help him when you realize that Legion has dispersed from the fight, making it an even 2v2, possibly picking up a kill. Having your lane that has been roaming and split pushing with their promote continue to push down on a lane that is still in a 1v2 or just nobody is there at that point in time, net yourself a kill by intercepting the jungler. Keeping constant vision on the map, making sure that you are always able to be offensive in pressing your advantages and not trying to use them for a defensive point of view is going to be keeping your team that much further ahead in the game. Constant denial of buffs, constant grabbing of global objectives, just constant movement on the map, keeping the enemy team super, super afraid of where you could be at any time with that threat of the teleport just looming over their heads the entire time. And this is what to be identified as how powerful CLG's pushing composition can be. However, Legion did not get too owed by CLG. Spoiler alerts, I did that like half an hour ago. Regardless, CLG had a little bit of competition from Legion, and they had to basically, they did the same sort of strategy in game number two, but Legion was able to react to it and able to generate an advantage in their favor. So what I'm going to do is, well, this VOD is still running, huh? Where's my marker? Okay. So I have to go a little bit forward in the VOD. Like I said, it's all crammed together in um, one giant, like, four-hour VOD or something like that, so... I'm not able to, oh, I missed it. I'm not able to, like, uh, quickly just, like, jump and be like, oh, okay, well, it's right here. Let me just go to this VOD. Let me just go to that VOD. I have to uh, work the little Ustream scrolly thing, which not doesn't like me all the time. But um, regardless of that, what we're going to be seeing is bands and picks to see how they can combat the strategy. Um, early game aggression, early game decision making to see how they're going to be able to stop that those advantages that CLG got extremely early with the buffs, with the lane swats, with the invades, with what was going on. Um, shutting down the pushes altogether and staying very, very proactive on the map just to try to generate advantages early on to combat the early advantages that CLG was trying to get. So uh, I got the VOD all started right now. Um, quick drink of water. Uh, and we'll get into game two. So we can now that we identified what CLG did and how powerful the strategy can be, we're going to go on the opposite side now and be like, okay, well, um, if I'm playing a rank fives team, if I'm in solo queue, if uh, I am team Legion, what do we do to try to combat this and how can we stop it so we can identify it early, we can try to figure out how we're going to shut this down, we can get ourselves into a, victor a victorious position and force a game three against CLG. First thing that you're going to wind up doing, <laughs> Rivington and Freak have dirt faces and Boy Boy's smirking at something. Probably looks like he's actually telling uh, Inubish that he has a crush on him or something. Hotshot does not seem very, very amused. And uh, Double Lift seems very, very into uh, picking his champion, which was Sivir once again. But regardless of funny things on the screen, what Legion has done here, they banned out Karthus and Alistar in the first game because they're afraid of what happens if CLG gets those champions. They ban out Sona which is interesting, regardless to say. Um, by banning out Sona, they stopped the global, like, the, not the global, they stopped the big giant team fight crowd control, and they take away one of the poking champions in that 1v2 lane. They secure their picks in Corky once again, so he has superior poke in lane, but they also pick up Blitzcrank, which, against Sivir, is normally a bad pick. Because, okay, what do you have? Well, you have Rocket Grab, you have Robot Arm to try to grab Sivir in and do something. Sivir has Spell Shield. That doesn't work. You're just going to refund Sivir's mana costs. However, by having Corky to poke and prod at Sivir, by having Janna that is going to put up a shield to absorb some of that damage, and by having Blitzcrank to have the ever-looming threat, you're like, oh, okay, well, even if we get in the 2v2 lane, we have ways to wear away their shields and wear down their Spell Shields so we can eventually trade damage through straight auto attacks through Blitzcrank's power fist through ultimate if we get that far into the laning phase on top of this blitzcrank is the ultimate shut down 1v2 champion if you're a one champion in a lane against two enemies and one of them is blitzcrank with his rocket grab with his knock up through power fist with a silence aoe from his ultimate and with an ad carry to just rain the pain down upon you you are not going to be in a very happy place no matter what champion you are doesn't matter is if you're tough as nails and have ridiculous amounts of armor on your room page doesn't matter if you're york you're still going to have a very difficult time in that lane if blitzcrank's gonna be grabbing you and knocking you up cork is gonna be like gatling gun down upon you doesn't matter. You're going to be in a world of pain. So you don't want that happening. So what's going to happen is 
by forcing this Blitzcrank pick, Legion is already assuming that CLG is going to be trying to swap the lanes up again. As we identified as one of the key things to the promote strategy from CLG, you swap lanes to generate advantage so you can use that promoted minion to knock down the tower extremely early, give yourselves a large gold lead, and then let your team roam around to set up advantages in other places. Aside from this, Legion has also gained Gragas. Now, Gragas was taken by CLG in game one, and even though we didn't see Gragas doing a whole lot besides 1v1ing on the bottom lane, he has extremely ridiculous wave clearing power. He has the ability to poke and harass from a very far way away. He has the ability to push a lane by himself through his barrels, through his body slam, just through aggression. He has a way to sustain through his W, so he gets extra mana. His passive heals him up in HP. Gragas is a ridiculous champion overall. By stealing this away from CLG, they're forcing them to take weaker picks, to take backup picks. We see GG deciding he's going to take Twisted Fate into this game. Twisted Fate doesn't have the same team fight presence as a Gragas does. He also doesn't have the disengage from Gragas' explosive cast ultimate. However, he does have Destiny, so he goes fairly well with the teleport strategy. So he goes fairly well with the being able to be in multiple places and push down objectives. So even though he is a very strong pick for CLG's composition, while cars doesn't clear as good as the cast and the barrels do from Gragas. He doesn't have the same kind of sustainability in lane. He is going to have basically infinite mana through his pick a card, picking up a blue card, throwing it away, getting all his mana back, being able to do things that Gragas can't by getting a Sheen, eventually a Lich Bane, and push down towers. It's not going to be as effective, though, as trying to push down these towers extremely early, which is something CLG was going to be doing. Um, you talked about how Blitzcrank is going to be punishing the 1v2 lane swap and everything. So um, what else has Legion done to, in order to uh, get themselves into this game 2 and try to force a game 3? Well, uh, let's take a look. We're going to go a little bit into the future here. And um, one thing that Legion has done is, okay, we see that CLG once again is going to be going for the 2v1 in the mid lane. Greg is going to be able to deal with this a lot better than Zyra was. He's a little bit tankier, he has more long-range poke, and he has sustainability. We talked about this already. One other thing Legion's going to be doing this game is invading the jungle. And this is huge. They just let CLG sit back, they let CLG take the bus they wanted to, and let them sustain in this lane. One of the key things to that 1v2 that Legion had was the fact that Olaf had a blue buff and could sustain his undertoes ridiculously in that top lane. So by stealing away the blue buff, they deny the resource to CLG, and then by using every single advantage and trick that they have in their book, they're able to keep CLG down by Blitzcrank pulling blue buff over the wall. It's my favorite thing to do in normal games, and it really annoys the crap out of my team, or the enemy team. But regardless of this, Voiboy has to go and get his red buff by himself. It's not nearly as effective as the blue buff, because he can't just sustain himself by throwing axes back and forth, assuming he's in a, a 1v2 lane. What uh, Legion does is they don't swap lanes at all. They generate their normal advantageous lanes by keeping the, one, the, two, the two on the bottom, keeping the AP in the mid lane, keeping Rumble in the top lane, and now Voiboy is like, oh, okay, well, I have a red buff. I might be able to harass down upon Rumble a little bit, but the rest of the lanes are like, oh, okay, well, um, now we're at some sort of disadvantage because Mundo has zero buffs. Enemy blue buff was stolen. Voiboy took his own red buff. Uh, allied blue buff was secured. Lord of Mortis is taking that right now as we could speak, as we could see that on the mini map. So the only buff left on the map is the enemy red buff for Hotshot. We can see already the promoted minion in the mid lane has been used to try to generate advantages. We have a Janna shield to keep it alive as well, but probably he's continuing to poke and prod and use his skills to keep the rest of the minions out of the picture. A promoted minion is good, but a promoted minion 1v1ing a tower is still bad. Promoted minion isn't this something that can just walk in there and take down the tower by itself. So probably he's using these barrels and using his AoE, using the damage he didn't have on Zyra to his advantage. We see Twisted Fate, meanwhile, in this 1v2 lane, is doing absolutely jack shit. <laughs> Twisted Fate can't do anything against Corky and Blitzcrank. He has 5 CS, he's trying to roam into the jungle, and eventually, CLG is forced to lane swap. So now that Twisted Fate is at a disadvantage overall, he can't beat out Gragas and CS at this point. Their mid lane, which is their AD carry and their support, have to rotate bottom, and are currently losing out on CS to Corky and Blitzcrank. 
and now they've been able to be pushed back to the tower, take a couple pot shots at that as well, and Legion has effectively negated all the early game advantages that CLG had in game one. At five minutes and 30 seconds in the last game, Legion's middle tower was at half HP. At four minutes and 20 seconds into this game, the middle tower hasn't been touched. None of the towers on Legion's side have been touched. Hotshot Amundo is level 3. We look over to Lord of Mortis' Malphite, he's already level 4. Hotshot has not crossed the river once this game. He has to use his smite on small camps to try to clear. He has to try to keep himself into this game. He's not having the same effectiveness that he had last game. Legion, even though it's only a couple hundred gold, still effectively has a lead. It's not really much, but they're not down 2,000 gold at 5 minutes into the game like they were in game number 1. So they are really stopping the aggression by being aggressive back on the CLG. And now CLG's strategy is, well, wait, hold on a second. Our strategy is the fact that we get super aggressive, we have giant creep waves, we have promoted minions, we have teleports, and we keep pushing these advantages. There's just no way that they're able to do this right now because Legion is like, okay, well, you want to be aggressive. We're going to be aggressive back. And considering we have Ignites, considering we have our own teleports, we have cleanses, we have uh, initiators like Blitzcrank, we have Malphite who can absorb a lot of damage and slow you down. Eventually at level 6, he's going to be able to use his uh, Unstoppable Force to get into these fights and force fights in Legion's favor. Re all these things we have are going to be counter-aggressive to your own. Even right here, Void Boy and Hotshot are like, okay, let's go for a gank. They don't even see Lord of Mortis in the bush, despite them having a ward. So now Legion is going to generate more advantage by picking up things like First Blood. Okay, that's awesome. So now that they have OP First Blood Gold, Legion is going to continue to push advantages. Probably is doing a great job of just sustaining against Twisted Fate in mid lane and keeping his CS advantage up. A lot of Mortis being ballsy right here is going to go in and pick up a kill on Hotshot. Cruiser puts a flash down that a lot of people say he didn't need to do. Doesn't matter. You're securing yourself to stay alive. You're making sure you generate these advantages. All of a sudden, now Legion 2 kills to 0 at the point in time that the middle tower for them was about to fall last game. Legion has been able to halt the aggression from CLG and play it extremely smart and turn it back onto them. Lot of Mortis now... We can see him going back to his own jungle, clearing that out. He's going to be at the advantage that Hotshot was last game. Now that they've killed him, even Hotshot's level 4, Lot of Mortis level 5, about to hit level 6 at this point in time, he's going to be able to go and do the counter jungling. We can see him right here. Goes through his own raid camp, decides he's going to go up to the enemy walls. He's going to be able to counter jungle. He's going to be able to initiate in that bottom lane from behind. He's going to be able to capitalize on the advantages that CLG had last game that they were using against Legion. So by halting the extremely early aggression, by playing heads up and smart, and by playing to their strengths, they're able to turn things around. Lot of Mortis comes from behind and gets a gank. The double knockup on double lift is insane. They have teleports coming in from Twisted Fate with Destiny. Uh, Gragas identifies this and immediately uses his own teleport to follow. Look at the damage coming out here from Legion on the CLG. It's a huge fight that goes in Legion's favor. Even though they're not able to capitalize by picking up kills and just really forcing it down CLG's throat at that point in time, these big fights going in favor of Legion are just showing how they've been able to combat the strategy being played up by CLG and they're ripping open weaknesses and holes and just continuing to punch through in these open wounds of CLG. By doing this, later on in the game, like 40 minutes, 50 minutes, however long the game went down, Legion's going to be able to take down a victory. They're actually also going to be able to take down the first turret a little bit later. So overall, by keeping control of the tempo of the game, you're able to combat this push strategy super effectively. Like Pokemon terminology, everything, that's that's just all it is. By keeping control of the game, you're never letting the people who promote do what they want to do. Promote is a great spell in the fact that if you have some sort of advantage you can get early on if you have some sort of way to abuse it and by taking down towers early or just keeping your gold up or whatever you're going to be able to generate a larger and larger advantage because of your overall map presence by pushing down towers by pushing lanes that you're not even going to be in and by threatening to go into the lane where the super minion is by just teleporting onto it so legion shuts this down effectively and takes game two Game 3 was a little bit more standard, and I'm not going to talk about that one, so you guys can check that out on your own. But aside from this, 
All right, we've diagnosed the push strategy. We've diagnosed the, the strengths. We've taken account for the weaknesses. And now you're basically going to be able to expect to see it a lot in solo queue. You're going to have supports going and be like, oh, I could take promote. This will be great. CLG did it. And that's, you know, it's solo queue mentality. Myself included have been uh, guilty of doing this last night. Like I said, with my friend Chaz Wang, Grudic Dwarf, if you guys remember him from Battle Arenas a little bit earlier on. Um... He was playing support, I was playing AD carry, and we decided that, hey, let's try to convince our team to let us do the CLG push strategy in one of our lanes and see how effective just the promote is all by itself. Oh no, I'm locked into the client. Oh no, I can't get over to XSplit. Okay. So like, how effective is this strategy going to be? Like, okay, what we have here, I decided to pick up Sivir, channeling my best double lift, and Druidic Dwarf decided he was going to pick up Nunu. Nunu uh, generates some good advantages because of Blood Boil. He gives this to the promoted minion as well as Sivir. He also has Slow Down, so he can just basically continue to harass down enemies that will pop up in lane, and, you know, this is going to be something else he could do. So we uh, eventually convince our allies that we're going to be able to go into a 2v1 in top lane, and by doing so, all right, look at this giant wave we have. It's not the, the Siege Minion wave, so we're a little bit bad at predicting where it's going to be. I'm a little bit bad at hitting Boomerang Blades as well. But we keep the Harass down in the regular 2v1 lane, very similar to what we've seen coming out from the metagame recently. We fast forward a little bit, we have our promoted minion. Or we have a Siege Minion that will be able to be promoted. We're going to save this until we get to the tower, so we're able to get the CS for myself, be able to keep myself nice, and boom, there we go. Because of Blood Boil being max first, our... At this point in time, it's only rank 1. Because of the way Blood Boil works, we're able to keep a Blood Boil on me as well as a promoted minion for a decent length of time. One thing that we do wrong here is let the promoted minion tank the tower because we didn't freeze the lane properly. We also do this goofy thing where we decide, like, oh, we're going to use the teleports to, like, super tank the minion there. But we're able to pick up first blood because of this. Regardless, I am going to die to a Fiddlesticks gank because Fiddlesticks OP character. Um... But aside from this, we're able to generate advantages in our lane right away. Our support character in Nunu, also going to be able to survive this engagement. He runs into Orianna because of his slow, because he's tanky, because Katarina comes up. We're actually able to survive that one. So even though we had a little bit of a a little bit of a derp right there, we pick up first blood for our team, and we're able to keep uh keep ahead of Darius in that lane. So slowing it down a little bit again. Um Nunu goes back, he's deciding to buy some items. Spell shield on Sivir is going to be ridiculously good, especially in that top lane where you have to use spells to generate an advantage, doesn't matter how bruisery you are or not. Poor Cassidin. We actually put Cassidin in a 1v2 in bot lane because of this, but he's being a trooper. He's getting through it. And now we have uh, Nunu back in lane. We can see this promote, about three quarters cool down. We are just going to be able to, well, there's an apprehend, there's a spell shield. We're going to be able to trade effectively with Darius. We keep this advantage up. We can see 30 CS compared to Darius' 10 at this point in time. Here comes the wave. Here comes the promoted minion as soon as we're able to knock down Darius a little bit. And... No, we don't promote that minion. Okay, that was a little bit of a misstep by Chaz there. But uh, if we promoted that minion, it would have been healed. We would have had more creeps. We probably would have been able to take down Darius. But Darius is gone, so that lets us just... Okay, well, we're in a 2v1. Let's take down the tower. So we are going to fast forward. Spoiler alert, the tower goes down at about 7 minutes and 30 seconds into the game. That's the same time that the tower went down in the CLG game. So Darius decides he's going to be trying to be a little bit sneaky. Doesn't matter. We have spell shields. We have ice blast. We slow him down. Boom. Promote the minion. Darius at less than half HP had to return in the lane. There's a full wave of creeps right here. We're just going to continue to do this. On the hunt has been activated. It does work on the minion in addition to the blood boil. Our minion has about 2.15 attack speed. Uh, we do actually get ganked by Fiddlesticks once again. A little overextension. Like I said, that's why you need wards. That's why you need to keep yourself aware of what's going on. We're able to knock down the tower almost, rel almost as quickly as possible. We do actually get forced back a little bit. I think I died to Darius at some point here. Yeah, I died to Darius and Fiddlesticks. But, um... Regardless, we're still generating advantages. Our lane is pushed all the way down to the second tower. Darius has 20 CS compared to, you know, me who has 53. So even though, you know, we're dying a little bit, if we fine tune the game, you know, we're going to have a very, very large advantage from this strategy. Darius has to go back because he realizes that I'm coming. And because of this, we're able to just go do, 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 march all the way down. Don't even need to promote a minion. We take out the second tower. 11 minutes into the game. Okay, Darius decides he's going to try to do the same exact thing as before. Thinks he could go in on me. Doesn't matter. His spells aren't doing any damage because I have spell shield. And we actually use the absolute zero and promote. We clear the wave. We knock down this tower. We knock down the inhibitor. It's what, 12 minutes into the game, I think, is when this goes down. 11 minutes and 54 seconds into the game. We have knocked down an inhibitor. 
Now we're going to rotate around. We're going to be like, oh, okay, there's an Oriana here. There's members of the enemy team coming down. Okay, what else can we do? Excuse me. We uh, decided we're going to like fool around a little bit. But now that we have this advantage, we knock down our lane, we can roam around. They decide, oh, it's a team fight. Oh, okay, we'll get in a fight here. Uh, we're just going to kill you a bunch of times. Even though the enemy team picks up some kills as well, oh, Mundo comes in, he's going to clean up, he gets a lot of extra kills, and we just generate an advantage. And as you can see, I'm just going to speed up a little bit more, because uh, I'm running very low. I decide maybe I could teleport in and generate an advantage by 1v1ing Darius, that doesn't work. Uh, my team does come in and clean up, we continue to push advantages down, we decide to pressure down on the Nexus turret. There's a bit of a team fight that goes down, but after this, I decide I'm going to split push. Mundo and Cassid on the bottom are split pushing, so we take down that tower, we rotate, we take down another tower. I know it's going very fast, but uh, I'm just very briefly showing that once you get that advantage, once you shut down, Darius can't actually fight super minions, which is a hilarious thing, let alone a promoted minion. So we just systematically take down every single inhibitor, take down every single tower, and now that, well, the game's basically done, we just attack the Nexus, attack the turrets, and they're going there before they can even surrender. 18 and a half minutes into this game, we win. So if you have, you know, a friend that you want to be able to take this push strategy into, like, solo queue or whatever, you want to ask me, oh, Optimus, Tom, this strategy actually work outside of professional play? Yeah, because you generate some most ridiculous advantages that you could possibly think of extremely early into the game. So guys, you've identified what CLG has done. You identified what the key components to the strategy are. Just too long, didn't read. If you guys are uh, just tuning in, we see there's a lot of you. Awesome. Hopefully you guys tune in every single week because I do this every single week at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for In The Zone. But uh, key points, you want to pick people that can push. You want to pick champions that you know you could get a 2v1 advantage with. Whether it's sending Gragas into the bottom lane, even if he's in a 2v1 at that point in time, you could generate some sort of advantage by pushing. You want to be able to knock down towers as quickly as possible, pick up kills wherever you can, pick a roaming jungler who's going to be able to keep vision on the enemy team to be able to roam around and shut them down. You want to be able to keep that vision so you keep your lane safe, you don't overextend into ganks from the enemy jungler, especially if it's someone with a root in place like Maokai. You want to be able to give your solo lane, especially if they're not 1v2, some sort of early advantage to sustain. We saw Voiboy taking a blue buff in game 1, it did ridiculously awesome things for him. In game 2, he didn't get it, he was in a 1v1, and it didn't work out for him. So you want to generate as many early advantages as possible and ride the wave into the later stages of the game, continuing to deny your enemy a bus, global objectives, and overall map vision and presence. On the flip side, if you are trying to shut down the enemy composition, you want to get aggressive quick back onto it. Make sure you take away key components to their strategy. Gragas officially, well, uh, it's effectively the most, the most, eff effectively the most effective. <laughs> they, by taking Gragas away from GG, probably was able to sustain himself in that 1v2 mid lane, and he was able to stay relevant for the rest of the game. Picking up Blitzcrank so that they go for that 1v2, you have the aggression being able to do goofy things like pull your own blue buff over the wall after you invade to halt their own invade, put their jungler at a disadvantage, continue to roam all over the map, and do the same sort of things that they want to do, but since you're ahead of them, you could do it better. That's what you want to be able to do in this case. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed this episode of In The Zone. Hopefully, you'll, like I said, a lot of you guys are watching live this time, which is awesome. I'll put this up on the GG Chronicle YouTube channel over on YouTube.com slash GG Chronicle if you guys want to check that out. But um, in addition to this, hopefully you guys have learned a lot. This is going to be it for this episode. I actually went a little bit longer than I like to. Normally, like 45 minutes. This is almost an hour. So uh, hopefully you guys with the in-depth strategy and the analysis of the composition, you guys have been able to learn something. I know I definitely have from going over the replays as well. So uh, hopefully you'll tune in next week for In The Zone. Uh, hopefully I'll have the next episode on the Dignitas Poke Comp that you guys also really, really like from PAX Prime, the North American Regional Qualifiers. Um, if not, like I said, my name is Optimus Tom. You can find me on Twitter at Optimus Tom. I'll answer any of your questions any given time of the day as long as I'm not asleep, which is often. But uh, aside from that, like I said, check out the VOD over on YouTube.com slash GG Chronicle. We have a lot of interviews from the qualifiers as well up there. Pro players, Riot, Riot people, anybody you can think of, we have interviews for them there. Also, check out ggchronicle.com, your number one destination for League of Legends coverage on the internet. Otherwise, guys, my name is been Optimus Tom. I'm going to get out of here. I'm losing my voice. I need a little bit more water. But uh, I'm going to get in there, play some games, and hopefully, uh, or not hopefully, I'll see you guys on there trying out the push strategy from CLG. So uh, catch you later, guys. And maybe that's why you're all
talk, no action. Seek 